Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Holy Spirit has not stopped reforming the Church of Christ. Amen. Instead, the Holy Spirit is keeping Christ's church in the true faith, correcting, inspiring instruction, providing courage to bear witness to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And the question in Germany posed by Martin Luther over 500 years ago, and the question to us today is, are we a part of that? Are we exercising our faith, correcting our errors, reading God's word for ourselves, allowing ourselves to be inspired by teaching and bearing witness to Jesus Christ. It's a true story. In my prior call, the church property was positioned between the town's hospital, so that meant life flights in the middle of service. You just stopped and dropped and prayed. A coffee corporation, often smelled like burnt coffee when they had stuff going on, yeah. Doctor's offices and lower income housing units. We often had visitors of all sorts, with folks walking or biking right through our property one place to the other. Now, Jose walked through our church property a lot every day, and I always greeted him when I saw him. But one particular week, he dared to take the extra steps of walking into the church after repeated invitations. It would be easy to make some assumptions about Jose, given his appearance. Those assumptions would probably have been wrong. Jose told me about his great love for Jesus. In broken English, he explained his background and why he was not actively involved in a church. Now, there are a lot of Jose's out there. We had a lot of Jose's last night. Amen. About probably 400 Jose's last night, along with the extra hundred of people we knew. They've either misunderstood what the Church of Christ is about, never been introduced at all, or have been burned by the church in some way. The truth will set you free. I had more faithful conversations with some Jose's last night than I've had in quite some time in one spot in the course of a couple of hours. But Jose, that man is a walking church. He continues to be. His witness was amazing. He echoed and even recited parts of Psalm 46 that we just read. He spoke to me about the trouble that he had gathered from every angle in his life about his childhood in Puerto Rico, about the things that he could not control that made him very uncomfortable. He also spoke about his very personal reformation when he identified his part in accountability of what was happening to him, with him, using words of Apostle Paul and Martin Luther, Jose said to me, as never before, we must now change ourselves. Trouble used to come from outside the church, but now it comes from every angle. But God is always here. He is with us. And I thought to myself, if we all had the courage to be lit on fire for the Lord, like my fast friend Jose that walked in off the street, what would happen? When the earth changes, and we've seen a lot of that lately, when the mountains shake, when the waters roar, when things that are scriptural give way to personal and public opinion polls, when our world that sees everything as temporary while revelation tells us about eternity, what do we do with all of that? John tells us that the truth, the truth, capital T, not our own personal truths, or truthiness, as Stephen Colbert said once, not some truth told us by mere mortals, 
but the truth from God and his holy word, that sets us free. So from the small catechism, we are to, and some of you have this memorized from when you use little itty bitty, right? We are to fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Above all things. And Revelation tells us that we need to learn this lesson now. Why are Christians afraid of that book? Not a bit of it designed for you, all that wrath stuff. If you're a Christian, that's not for you. If you're a Christian, your job in Revelation is to tell other people about Jesus. That's the instruction of Revelation. Don't wait to fear, love, and trust God in His glory on the day of judgment, but every single day we have breath. That's the lesson. So this is why I have such issue with this statement, and in church we hear it all the time. I have said it myself and lived to regret it. The children are the future of the church. Well, yes, but. Folks, I'm here to tell you, if we really believe that they are only the future of the church, they're not going to wait that long. We'll have no future. We don't wait for them to gain our approval for growth and service in Christ's church with the instruction right in front of us that says to fear, love, and trust God above all things. Our children have trouble from every side in a way that we might not have ever experienced before at their ages. They're going through some stuff every day. They don't just need something to placate themselves. They don't need to wait to graduate to a certain age to provide service to their church. They need to feel meaning and purpose. They don't just need to come to church to punch a moral time clock. They need exactly what we need. They need the truth and the life. They need Jesus living in their hearts every day, loving them every second of every day. If they're noisy, If they take a misstep, they need to know the love of Jesus. They need to be grounded in God's word enough that when the trouble comes, and it will, they are not swept away by the undertow of desperation so big that they find other ways to fulfillment that are only temporary and not eternal. And we generally like having guidelines as long as we agree with them. Yes. Every scientific journal will pray structure for children. And if you watch a playground long enough, rules will eventually accompany every single game they come up with, even if they make the rules up on the spot. And it's not just about structure for children. Dementia and Alzheimer's games for caregivers, those guides and things that they have them do, tell us that routine is comfort to a patient. But for children... And for elders, okay, as much as we rebel against it sometimes, we like to have a standard measure. So what happens in those in-between years? You know, most of them, the dash. Righteousness causes a big problem, big problem, because we get condemned every single time. And every time we know the rules... The rules mirror our sin back to us, our missteps. Imagine if God followed us around like a state trooper putting on his holy lights every time we sinned, giving us citations. Well, we'd never get out of jail. And this is why we Lutheran Christians are law and gospel people. We need structure and law. And we desperately need to know the grace of God to provide the ultimate mulligan when we cannot measure up to the requirements. While it's far too casual to call our Lord and Savior Jesus a get-out-of-jail-free card, the truth for all eternity is that we cannot keep ourselves from sinning. It's human nature. Our trust in Christ for the salvation we cannot provide for ourselves is the basis of the righteousness that God provides graciously. Thank God. Great. Problem solved, right? Unless we're those people. Those people. You know, those people that like to brag about what they've done for Jesus that got them out of trouble. Well, for some people, that's called testimony. Depends on how you say it, right? 
Or they upped their scorecard to sinlessness and took points off their sin licenses. We know those people, don't we? Our old Adam rears its ugly head and makes us those people sometimes, doesn't he? Because we want to feel good. We want to pet ourselves. Romans 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, see, sin is a tricky thing. We want the very things that destroy us. And sin tells us that lies are the truth. That pretend is better than reality. Think reality television here or any number of current ads on the television. We have to remember that God's people had been living in bondage and several times. So when Jesus told them that the truth would set them free, they thought that was laughable. They started talking about their heritage, their ancestors. Well, we've never been slaves to anybody. Jesus spoke with them about their enslavement to sin. And while Jesus was speaking to them about that, their perspective could not grasp it fully because they had this earthly view. They couldn't get there fast enough. They went literal and basically pulled the, well, who are you? Because here's my lineage, that card. Jesus Christ was not PC. Nor did he apologize for his own choice of words. He bluntly told them how much sin controlled them every day. And when Jesus sets us free from our sin, those chains of slavery are broken. And most of you know that song. Did you recognize where it came from, actually? My chains are gone. I've been set free. My Lord, my Savior has ransomed me. Now, Martin Luther would have hated the fact that we're called Lutherans. That's why I told the kids that. Now, think about that. He started a movement. Not because he was anti-Catholicism, not at all. If you've been to a Catholic service, you know how similar we are in worship and in liturgy because it's scripture. Martin Luther became victim to the modern-day equivalent of hater disorder. You know that one. That's when if I don't agree with everything you say, then I must hate you. He became a victim to that because he dared to disagree with some of the things that he did not find in scripture were exactly on cue for the church. We have this rampant disease of that disorder running around these days. There's no, I can disagree with you because people will move mountains to prove you wrong so they can be right. That's nothing new. Martin Luther disagreed strongly, so strongly he was willing to put his life on the line with how some of the things were happening in Christ's church and he had the strength of God's truth behind him to make those statements. And those statements displayed God's truth so well, they became issues that changed religion and history for over 500 years now. Some of you are well versed in this, but if you have friends and neighbors in Christ, nothing wrong with that. Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, Pentecostals, they all came out of that movement, whether they believe it or not. Their leaders were reformers in their own right, but it all started here. And Luther would never claim all of that as his own baby. He would vehemently claim God's truth was exposed. If there were a chant, people of the Reformation would have chanted, it would have been, Sola Scriptura! Sola Scriptura! Not, Luther, Luther, Luther! His primary focus was getting God's living word into everybody's hands so that they could read it for themselves and discover just how much God's word would live in their lives. So here's some more truth. We are absolutely dependent on Christ for our salvation, and that's nothing to brag about to ourselves or to our neighbors, about our role in lassoing Jesus as if we could. Jesus claims you. Jesus chooses you. You are his child through water and word. Sola Scriptura, word alone. Now, you've noticed that I try really hard to refrain from calling you members of this church. What's my preferred word? Disciples. Disciples of Christ at Oregon. There's a reason for that. Please remember that Jesus tells us in the gospel today that disciples are those who abide in his word. They live in it. 
The first disciples wanted to live with Jesus. They wanted to follow him everywhere he went. They stayed with him and they listened to his every word. People took great pains to follow Jesus. And that was not a series of religious traditions or repairing things without thinking about what we're saying or making promises to God with no intention of keeping them. Last night, I'm a member of the church. I heard it would be great if all these people were here at church tomorrow. And because I hardly ever see them other than trunk or treat, I said, yeah, wouldn't it be? Wouldn't it be? Now that sounds mean, but the truth will set you free. It's very easy for us to not clean house with ourselves. That discipleship is a serious thing. It's abiding in him. It's abiding in his word. That active faith allowed Jesus' disciples to say things like, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live is in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. They did not, his disciples did not commune together and use their stewardship to make a reservation for the burial plot across the street. They communed together and used their stewardship because they disciplined themselves according to what Jesus told them to do every day. And the church, capital C, all of us, all of God's people, grew out of 11. 11, remember, Jesus had a different plan. And then 72. And then more. That old hairspray commercial, and she told her friend, and she told her friend, and by the time you get to the end, the screen's full of people. Disciplined people. Psalm 138 tells us, On the day I called, you answered me, and my strength of soul, you increased. Now that is the type of discipleship Jose relayed to me in that sanctuary, having been through life experiences that most of us will never see, thank God, and giving thanks to God because of God's response through the storms in his life. I reminded him that his disciples didn't work alone. And I hope that made a difference in his life and that he found a faith family eventually. But God's word is living. The more you immerse yourself in his word, the more you realize that his word is living in and through your life. Things make sense. It didn't make sense before. Pay attention. God is speaking to us every single time we open his word. Every time. Just open it up and read a page and you'll see it working in your life. So yes, the Holy Spirit is still today even reforming the church of Christ and keeping it in the true faith and correcting us and inspiring instruction and giving courage to bear witness to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And yes, we are a part of that exercising our faith right now, correcting our errors right now, allowing ourselves to be inspired by teaching and bearing witness to Jesus right now. Now, these words are not mine. These words belong to Keith and Kristen Getty. You're going to hear these words sung in an anthem today. I cry in choir rehearsal reading these words. It's the perfect prayer. So please pray with me. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Teach us, Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. Cause our faith to rise. Cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail. Let their truth prevail over unbelief. Speak, O Lord. Renew our minds. Help us grasp the heights of your plans for us. Truths unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. By grace, we'll stand on your promises. And by faith, We'll walk as you walk with us. Speak, O Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. Amen.